Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Peter Starr, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. It's a real thrill to welcome you tonight to the Abramson Family Recital Hall. And on behalf of pres our president, Neil Kerwin, and our interlocutor for this evening, I'm especially delighted to welcome Lonnie Bunch to AU. Director Bunch, as you know, is the founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which will open this fall with President Obama in attendance. We're, of course, doubly happy and proud to have Lonnie here tonight because he earned both his bachelor's and his master's degree here at American University, training with outstanding faculty, one of whom is sitting right here, in the art department of history. Director Bunch was appointed founding director of the museum in 2005 after a distinguished term as president of the Chicago Historical Society. He's a celebrated author who has written extensively and importantly about the African-American experience in America and the representation of that experience in our cultural institutions. Lonnie and Neil will be talking this evening about Lonnie's time at AU and about the professional accomplishments that led to his appointment as the founding director of the National Museum. We will hear about the art, perhaps to the science, of building a new museum and the many choices that go into building the museum's mission, its design, its budget, and most importantly, its exhibition content. My guess is that the content might turn to fundraising, which I gather Lonnie <laughs> has had to do quite, quite a deal of. Please join Neil and me in welcoming back to American University Director Lonnie Bunch. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well, Lonnie, I'm, I'm not used to being on campus in a tie, okay? But yeah. <laughs> well, I'm used to it. <laughs> okay. um, Lonnie, let me add my welcome to Peters. Thank you. Terrific to see you again. Um, this is one of the most interviewed people on the planet. And I told Lonnie before we started that uh, if I actually ask him a question that he hasn't been asked before, I expect an exhibit <laughs> in the museum. <laughs> All right. But I'm going to start with some uh, personal reflections, Lonnie, uh, to talk a little bit about the path that brought you to the position that you currently occupy. Uh, I happen to have heard you speak very eloquently about early childhood experiences that formed you uh, as a person and perhaps started you on the path uh, to where you now uh, sit. Could you reflect a little bit about some of those early childhood experiences and then talk about, uh, if you could, how your interest in history and particularly African-American history evolved over your, your early years? Sure. You know, first of all, I'm just so pleased to be here. I, I really appreciate that. I'm so impressed that all of you would come out on St. Patrick's Day, because um, when I was an undergraduate, St. Patrick's Day was the day that we did scientific tests to see how fermented liquids affected the human body. Uh, so I'm quite impressed that you're here. Um, for me, I've been very fortunate. History has always been something that has been crucially important to me, and it really starts very young. Um, I really say that my grandfather, who was someone who began life as a sharecropper and ended life as a dentist, was somebody who really pushed education. And when I was a kid, before I was five, we would go into the basement, he would pull out books, and he would read to me. And one day he pulled out a book, and it had pictures of children. And he said to me that those children who look like me, the pictures were probably taken in the 1870s, and those kids were probably gone by now. And as I was pondering at the fact that, you know, children actually die, could die, he said to me, isn't it a shame that people could live their lives and die, and all it said under their picture was anonymous school children. And that got me so interested in trying to look and understand what people's lives were like. So I spent so much of my early years looking at photographs, trying to understand what was their life like. Were they treated fairly? Um, did they marry? What kind of life did they have? And part of that became so powerful and meaning to me, meaningful to me because I grew up in a town where there were very few black people. And so there were a lot of times when I faced bitterness, hatred, racism, and other times people embraced me in amazing ways and I couldn't understand why. So part of history 
was a way for me both to escape, to look back at a different time, but also to try to understand a little bit about race in America, to understand why certain people would embrace you and other people wouldn't let you in their backyard. And so for me, it was both, it was initially personal, and then it became something that I realized would help us all understand the lives we live if we understood the past a little better. Thanks, Lonnie. Uh, now, let's talk a little bit about how you came to American University. And um, the, uh, the things that I think this group would be most interested in were, would be uh, how that seed of interest in history was nurtured here, uh, how you decided to move from an undergraduate program to a graduate program. And by the way, I might add, uh, Lonnie is the recipient of a 2009 honorary degree of humane, in humane letters, a doctorate in humane letters from American. And the extent to which the work that was done here, both as an undergraduate and a graduate, uh, has uh, contributed to the work you're currently doing uh, at the museum. I think that there is no doubt that I would not be in this position if it wasn't for AU. There's just no doubt in my mind about it. Um, I was very fortunate to work with people like Alan Kraut, um, people who both challenged and nurtured. And what AU did for me was it helped me bring a sense of order and structure to somebody who just loved history and didn't really know what you could do with it, how to use it, and AU really helped me do this. And part of the reason I got to AU was because of someone who was here before Alan came, a professor named Dorothy Gondos. She was a 19th century historian. And I was on the campus basically hanging out. And I decided that I would like to go talk to somebody in the history department. And I went in, and I thought that maybe I'd get five minutes with somebody. And this woman spent three hours with me talking about books, talking about history, asking me what I was interested in. And I was so blown away by her generosity and her interest both in history and in me that I thought I needed to be on this campus. I needed to let this campus shape my educational experiences. And that's what got me here. And then I was so fortunate to run into Alan Kraut and Alan Lichtman and Bob Beisner, these people who did several things that were so important. On the one hand, they challenged you the desire to be the best historian you could be, to write better, to think more crisply, that was really important. But the other thing was, for a kid who's you know, 19, 20, 21, 22, is the sense of community that they also built. Um, we were very close as students and faculty. We used to play football together all the time. Um, and I really found, uh, it, it sounds silly, but I found a second home at AU, and I think the combination of the nurturing that allowed me to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up, as well as the kind of intellectual rigor, um, academic curiosity, is something that has stayed with me my whole career. What type of career did you envision for yourself while you were still with us? I thought I was gonna be an assistant professor at a small college in Massachusetts. That was my dream, um, pretty simple. Um, and I remember when I left AU, I was teaching at UMass, what's now called UMass Dartmouth. Um, and I thought, there's nothing better than this. But I had forgotten how much I loved museums. And that I realized that as much as I love teaching, I loved teaching on a broader palette, a broader canvas. I loved that museums allowed me to engage with people who were young, people who were old, people who were willing to wrestle with history because they were coming to the Smithsonian or a museum like that. But for me, it was always about reading and writing and learning about the past, and museums turned out to be the best platform for me to do that. So, uh, can you describe the path <clears throat> from your teaching it took you to museum management first and administrative work, and then ultimately to museum leadership. Each of the major positions you've held 
prior to the position that you currently hold? Well, I also have to be honest about how I stumbled into museums. Because even though when I was here at AU, I think I did an internship at the National Archives, I, I did work at the Library of Congress, it never dawned on me to work in museums, really. And there was a woman that I was in graduate school with who was, she seemed so old, she was probably 40. Um, <laughs> and you know, she said to me as I was ending my time here, she said, you know, you ought to go work at the Smithsonian. And I thought, who works at the Smithsonian? It's where you take dates because it's free. Um, <laughs> so she said her husband worked at the Smithsonian. Would I go meet with her husband? So I'm this 25-year-old kid, 26. I don't know what, what a great opportunity this is. Her husband turned out to be the head of science in the whole Smithsonian. He took me in to meet the head of the Smithsonian, the secretary. So I'm in bad jeans and really you know, big afro. Um, and I walk in, and we talk. And they say, we'd like to hire you. And I'm thinking, you're kidding. Um, and in those days, the Museum of American History was called the Museum of History and Technology. So I thought, great, I'm going to work at the Museum of History and Technology. And the secretary said, we don't have any jobs there. The only job we have for you would be at the Air and Space Museum. And I told them, I hate airplanes. I don't know <laughs> anything about space. And he said something that was really brilliant to me. He said, how much are you making as a TA? <laughs> and that $309, and when he said to me, if you come to work here, you'll make $1,000 a month, I said, I'm the expert on air and space. Uh, and that's literally how I got started. And I loved it, but I wasn't sure this would be it for me. So I left, I taught, and then the Smithsonian called back and they said, we'd really like you to come and be a curator at the Museum of American History. And to be honest, I was terrified. I thought, you know, I'm not good enough to be a curator at the Smithsonian. And the director of the American History in those days was a man named Roger Kennedy. And he called me and he said, I want somebody who believes that history matters, who believes that a museum can be part of a transformative ex experience for people. And if you're that person, come work with me. And I came back. And I had all these amazing opportunities to do exhibitions, to curate things, to build collections. One of the things I'm proudest of was I collected the original Greensboro lunch counter sit-in from mm -hmm. 1960. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized that this was what I did best. But I also knew that as much as I was interested in the work that I wanted to do, I also felt that I wanted to help change directions of institutions. I wanted to help other people do the work they wanted. So I ultimately was kept being bumped up. Um, and I became the associate director in charge of all the curators at the Museum of American History. And I had to learn a lot about both how do you take your passion and vision of history, but also how do you work with people? How do you sort of motivate people, convince people, especially scholars, to be able to work together? Um, and so I think for me, the Museum of American History was my training ground. It's what gave me the first taste of being in leadership. And when you're at the Smithsonian, it's very hard to leave, right? I mean, I think I'm probably the only person that left, ever left the Smithsonian twice. Um, <laughs> and that I was going to stay at American History forever. And then the Chicago Historical Society called and said, we'd like you to consider being the director of the museum. And to be honest, I wasn't sure I wanted to be a director. I wasn't sure I wanted to go to Chicago. But the Chicago people did something very brilliant. They had me meet the governor, um, the governor that's out of jail, not the one that's in jail now, <laughs> um, but a governor and the mayor, Mayor Daley, and they talked about the importance of history to the city of Chicago. And so I was hooked. And I learned so much there about leadership, fundraising, um, about how do you go from a vision to actually implementing that vision. And I fell in love with the city of Chicago. So my plan was, I'm in Chicago the rest of my life. And then the Smithsonian called and said, would you come back and run this new museum? And I told them no. I turned it down three times. Mm. But then I realized that 
being the director of the Chicago Historic Society, because there, you know, let's be honest, there are very few black folks that run these institutions. Being director of that institution nurtured my soul, but I realized that if I came back to run this museum, it would nurture the soul of my ancestors. So the reality was, it was no choice ultimately. But it really were those steps that led me to where I am now. Good. So right from the start, they knew you were the person to make this a reality. Is that correct? Um, I think I've been fooling people for years. And uh, I think that what they wanted was somebody who knew the Smithsonian, because the Smithsonian is its own Byzantine monster, um, but also who then knew how to run an institution that wasn't the Smithsonian. Okay. So I think they wanted me. Uh, I know that in several respects, the museum that you are now presiding over is literally an unprecedented undertaking. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to elaborate on that. But as you considered their offers on three separate occasions, you obviously had reservations about coming back and taking on, and you're going to pardon the pun, I hope, this monumental task. <laughs> okay. um, what were the reservations that, 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 that caused you, at least initially, to balk? And you've explained beautifully uh, why, ultimately, you couldn't say no. Well, I think one was family. I had moved to Chicago. My youngest daughter was going into eighth grade. Um, I had to commute when I moved to Chicago, and I hated commuting. And if I was going to come back to take this job, my youngest daughter was going to be a senior in high school. And so she wouldn't, I couldn't move and I'd have to commute again. So there was the commute. But it was really deeper than that. I have to be honest. I just wasn't sure I was good enough to do this. Um, even though I thought I knew how to fundraise, uh, you know, I raised $26 million in Chicago and they thought that was the greatest thing since sliced bread. $26 million is like not even a drop in the bucket for what we had to raise for this. So I was worried that I wasn't good enough to do it. The other, the other thing that was, was that it would force me into a level of visibility that I would be uncomfortable with. Um, I'm a good historian. I'd rather talk about Frederick Douglass than talk about me. And so recognizing that I would have to do that would be, was, was another reservation. And the final reservation really was that as much as I love the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian is a hard place to really take a vision and implement it. And I wasn't sure, I had to be sure that the Smithsonian would be a place that would let me continue to learn, but to kind of push the museum into areas that the rest of the Smithsonian hadn't gone down. Okay. Uh, I'm going to learn, we're going to turn now to your time as director and, and spend the remaining time on the project itself and your leadership of it. You've actually traced the origins of the project to more than 100 years ago. And could you share the history mm -hmm. with the group and, and the forces that finally came together to make this a reality? The idea for this museum began in 1913. 1913 was the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. And those of you may remember, there are amazing photographs of old Yankees and old rebels shaking hands, saying, you know, that we're back together finally. But you never see African Americans in those pictures. And that there were over 180,000 African Americans that participated in the Civil War. So there was this great outcry to say, wait a minute, there has to be something that helps America remember these people. So there was a real push in by 1916 to actually get space on the mall. Um, and there were, fundraising had begun, but then kind of World War I happened. Um, no, no building on the mall. The idea then was picked up again by Calvin Coolidge, which is probably the only the third time I've ever said Calvin Coolidge's name in my life. Um, <laughs> but he picked up this idea um, in the late 20s and said that I will support this. And what happened was, there was legislation introduced, there were even architects hired to design a building on the mall, then the depression happens. The idea lies fallow for years. It gets picked up periodically, um, but it goes nowhere. 
But what really makes this real is that by the 1980s, you begin to have people who realize that the civil rights generation was passing. Because remember, those of us that were old enough to remember the civil rights movement, it was a contested time. But in America's mind, it's a feel-good time. We all came together. So there was this sense of how do we capture that story? And so people like Congressman John Lewis began to introduce legislation to create this museum. He introduced it 18 times until it passed. And it finally passed because for the first time in 2003 when the legislation passed, it was bipartisan. Initially it was Republican, then it was Democrat, but John Lewis was able to get some very interesting bedfellows to be with him. He was able to get Sam Brownback from Kansas, who was about as diametrically opposed politically as you might expect. But we were they were able to bring that coalition together and get the legislation passed. So partly it was political. But the other reason it passed is because there had been 50 years of rigorous scholarship. Because the Smithsonian is a place run by scholarship. And suddenly you had the work of John Hope Franklin and many other people to provide the kind of intellectual foundation for the museum. And then I think the, the last piece was that you began to realize that there were Americans of all races who would be interested enough to actually give money. So all of that came together and led to the passage of legislation in 2003. But the reality was there's a big chasm between creating something on paper and making it real. The original mission of the museum was established how? And has it been refined significantly over the years since you've been its director? Well, you know, the, when the initial discussions around the museum were done, it was really to say, how do we make sure that the African-American experience has a stake somewhere? I mean, that was the vision. But my vision for it was a little different. I spent a lot of time thinking about what should a national museum be? What should it do? What should it be in the 21st century? And what should a national museum that explores issues of race, what should that be? So I came up with a vision that said, on the one hand, this museum had to be a place that would help you remember the rich history of the African American. It would be the place where America would get to wrestle with its tortured racial past. It would have to tell the unvarnished truth. It would have to have those moments where you cry over as you ponder the pain of slavery or segregation. But it had to also help people find the joy that is within this community. But to me, that wasn't enough. That for this museum to do what I thought it could do, it had to also take African American culture and use it as a lens to better understand what it meant to be an American. To say that this was not a black story by black people for black people, but in essence, it was the quintessential American story. It's the story that helps us understand our core values of resiliency, of spirituality, of optimism. And in some ways, I was shaped by something Alan Kraut said to me. Very early on, I said to Alan, okay, one of the things we're gonna have to wrestle with is the difficulty of slavery. And Alan brilliantly said, but Lonnie, the story is slavery and freedom. And that changed the way we thought about this museum and changed our vision. So ultimately it was that two-sided coin, but then I also thought that it had to be a place to help Americans deal with their international self. That Americans don't do global well, right? Um, and that I thought it was important that this story was both a story of how global considerations shaped the African American experience, but how the African American experience shaped the global world. For many people around the world, African American culture was their first introduction to America. So I wanted to be able to tell those stories. So, all, so basically, what really changed was having the benefit of this being my third Smithsonian Museum allowed me to think creatively about what are all the possibilities the Smithsonian could do. Good. We're going to reflect on the challenges, and they are really quite remarkable, and the ones you've overcome are, are simply extraordinary. But at the outset, you mentioned that it was very, very important for you to be aware of and sensitive to 
the possible impact of the museum on the very large network of existing African American museums in the country. How did you go about approaching those institutions, allay their concerns, and ultimately enlist their support? One of the big fears of creating a museum was that the Smithsonian is the big gorilla. It would come into towns, it would take all the resources, all the money, and these African American museums, whether it's the Charles Wright Museum in Detroit or the DuSable Museum in Chicago or the California African American Museum, they would all suffer because of this museum. So I had to figure out how do I get those institutions to feel comfortable? So the first thing I did was just symbolically. The very first speech I gave two weeks after I came back was to their organization, to the Association of African American Museums, and basically said that this museum is standing on your shoulders, and I recognized that. But then I realized I had to create opportunities for these institutions to feel that the Smithsonian or our museum would make them better. So we began to, first of all, create partnerships that would allow the Smithsonian to come into communities, but let those community museums reap the benefits. So for example, one of the things we did immediately was look to see how we could help African American museums coalesce, form part regional partnerships that we would help support financially. So we did things to help those institutions feel comfortable about us, and then always recognize that any time I went into a different city or a different community, I made sure the leadership of those institutions were part of whatever program I did. So that if I made the paper, they made the paper. So it really was a sense of recognizing that their success is our success. That the museum is only successful if all boats rise. Good. Now you mentioned that one of the great challenges at the outset was to create a sense of reality, even before there was a physical presence for the museum itself. Why was that so important, and how did you go about doing it? When I announced that I was leaving Chicago, I got beat up pretty good by many of the donors who felt that I had only been there five years and they really wanted me to stay. And so I got a call from Mayor Daley, uh, uh, rather a summons. So um, normally when you get summoned to Mayor Daley, you get five minutes, with your life. Um, but he calls me in and he starts talking for about an hour. And I'm finally saying, Mr. Mayor, what, what, what do you want? And he said, why do you want to go to a one horse company town called Washington, DC? <laughs> um, and more importantly, why do you want to run a project? Nobody cares about a project. So when I left his office, I realized he was absolutely right. So I decided that I would make the museum exist from the day I got there. So as soon as we came, as soon as I came back, I began to do exhibitions in the Smithsonian, in museums around the country. We began to create the museum on the web. We then did educational programs, help people publish books. So the goal was to eliminate anybody who would say to me, oh, you want to raise money? Come back when you're open. I wanted to say we were open from day one. And that really strategy was crucial to our success. It did a couple things. One, it did allow us to demonstrate to people the quality of the work that we would do. They loved the book and the exhibit we did on the Apollo Theater, or they were fascinated by the work we did on Jefferson and slavery. All of that was crucial. But the other part of it was that I had to hire staff. I started with a staff of two. Now I have 200 people. And the reality was, how do you hire good people if you tell them you're not going to see any of your work for a decade? Right? So this way I could say, you could write your book, you could curate your exhibition, you could build your collections. So it was really the key to our success was being real from day one. And that also allowed us to act like the Smithsonian. Rather than act like some little entity, you're the Smithsonian. Act like it. So all of that was part of creating an environment where people believed this was going to happen. Because I would say that was the biggest challenge, to say, we've heard about this for 100 years. Is this really going to happen? So that's why crafting the exhibitions, crafting the books, was so crucial to the success of this. Right. 
Um, you've, you've mentioned that this is the first national museum ever that started literally from scratch. So the magnitude of the task that, uh, that you took on is so daunting that it's almost difficult to put one's arms around it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you a series of questions about elements of the task. And if you could reflect a bit about how you approached it, uh, some of the worst challenges you faced and some of the, uh, some of the uh, concerns that you had at the outset, and then maybe take us to the, the present in some of these cases. Um, how did you start the original planning for the project? I mean, it, it, it must have been uh, an immense undertaking to simply develop the parameters of this thing uh, at the outset. Well, remember, I started with a staff of two, so I quickly hired two more people, so there were four of us. Um, I always describe it, it was like going on a cruise at the same time you're building the ship. And that what we did was, I, I realized that because I didn't have people to work with, we spent a lot of time on what should this museum be? What are the stories we should tell? But then I realized that to do that, we needed more help. So the first thing I did was hire people to actually do focus groups and surveys and scientific sampling to understand what the public knew about African American history and what they wanted to know. And then I worked with people like Alan Kraut and talked to all the best scholars around the country um, to get an idea of what the scholars said we should do and we should be. And so basically what we did then was marry all of that and realize that even if we had the best ideas of what the museum should be, what stories we should tell, because as you said, this is the only museum to actually begin without a collection at all. Suddenly you had to realize you can't tell the story in words or pictures, you've got to have stuff. So for us, it was identifying broad themes, broad areas we would wrestle with, and then we had to say, well, we're not sure how we're going to tell the story until we find the stuff. And that, in essence, the only overriding goal we had was to give the public not just what it wanted, but what it needed. Mm -hmm. And so that's what really began to shape some of the choices we began to make. Let's talk about selection of the site, and perhaps, uh, and then we're going to move to the building itself and spend a, a bit of time on how you selected uh, the architect and uh, how, the how the design of the building emerged. But let's talk about the site first because it Painful memories, okay. Um, <laughs> normally when Congress says to the Smithsonian, build a museum, they tell you where to put it. There was such a concern about should this museum take the last spot on the mall? Is this worthy of the mall? So Congress basically said, there are four sites you have to look at, you've got to evaluate, and you've got to make an argument. Well, one of the sites was a building that was built in World War I that was supposed to be up for two years, that was basically right by 395, and if we built there, I had to find money to rewrite the whole highway. Um, <laughs> The second spot was something called the Banneker Overlook, which was a site near Lafont Plaza that they said to me, well, but Lonnie, that's close to the mall. Um, nah. And then there was a desire to maybe take the old Arts and Industries building on the mall and turn that into a museum. And then there was a small piece of land, five acres of land, um, on the corner of 14th and Constitution. And most people told me, don't think about that. That's really not what you should do. There was a whole array of people who began to send letters both to me and to Congress saying, you know, you don't want to touch that site. And one of the arguments they made was that there was a version of the Macmillan Plan. The Macmillan Plan was a plan of how to use Washington, especially the mall. And they had a 1911 version of the Macmillan Plan that didn't have a building on the site we have now. And they said, well, if the Macmillan plan said there's no site, no building there, there should be no building. Well, they made a mistake. Alan Kraut trained me, I'm a pretty good historian, and there was a 1909 Macmillan plan <laughs> that I found, and it had a building there. 
So I said, here we go. Um, so that the issue then was to do all this research on traffic patterns, on how do you handle people, um, what are water issues, what are historical issues. And basically, I knew that it had to be on the mall where it was. I knew that if we chose the Arts and Industries building, that it would be hard to fundraise for a used building, to be perfectly honest. And I made the argument to Congress and to the regents, the Smithsonian governors, that the museum should be on 14th and Constitution. And it was a two-part argument. So I did my best sort of, you know, gully wash speech, you know, this is America's front yard, African Americans <laughs> deserve the right to be there, this is morally right, uh, that just died. It didn't go anywhere, there was no interest. So the next day, literally, I happened to have a meeting with Oprah Winfrey. And I said to Oprah, I said, all right, I didn't do very well. Um, and she said to me, she said, well, you know, Lonnie, if the building's on the mall, I'll give more money than if it's off the mall. So I came back and I embellished, I lied. Um, <laughs> I said, Oprah said that if it's on the mall, she'll give $20 million, but if it's off the mall, she's only gonna give one million, and I'm gonna have to come back to Congress for more money. They said, welcome to 14th and Constitution. <laughs> Let's talk about the building itself, its design, uh, the selection of an architect. Uh, this is a dramatic departure from much of the Smithsonian's architecture. Uh, and there's a very special story about the skin of the building. So can you talk, uh, I, I know that you've reflected before on the, uh, the challenges you faced in selecting an architect and selecting a design. Uh, talk about that process. Uh, its result as far as you see it right now, and then talk a little bit about that skin, which has boy, such a dramatic presence. Well, I think that the worst couple of months of my career was trying to figure out about an architect, because there were so many political issues. To do this right, you had to choose the right architect. But there were questions. There had never been an African-American architect who could build on the mall. So did the architects have to be black? Did they have to be American? There was such pressure that I was getting. I was getting um, lobbied by a whole array of different folks. And so what I realized is that the best thing I could do was to realize that that spot on 14th and Constitution is important, but it's a kind of funky little spot, right? So I thought, why don't we have an international design competition, get the best architects from around the world, regardless of race, and have them put teams together? Well, the Smithsonian didn't want to do that. They had never done that, and they were uncomfortable with it. Um, but I wasn't smart enough to listen, so I said, we're going to do it anyway. And what we did, though, is that I also said that while I could not demand, and I didn't want to demand, that the architect had to be African American, I put into the RFP that they had to demonstrate a real appreciation for the significance of African American culture. And so, again, the Smithsonian didn't want to do that, but I demanded. And that ultimately what we ended up with was, you know, 75 teams from around the world. Um, and we chose six. And we asked those six to create models. And to be honest, the, the architects I chose were initially my second choice. I, there was an architect that I loved. Um, he was an Israeli architect. He was brilliant. Um, he made a model I thought I was going to go with. And I said to him, as part of the process, I said, so we're going to have to have a 10-year marriage here. So how do we fight? How do we disagree with each other? And he said, well, the architect wins. <laughs> I'm a poor kid from Jersey, but he was gone. Um, um, and so then the issue was putting together a team. And I, I asked the architect to give me a team that reflected America. So they're African-American architects, non-African-American. And then the lead designer was somebody from the UK. And part of what hit me was that they really understood what I wanted. I had no idea what the building should look like. I knew that I wanted a building that said, resiliency, spirituality, and uplift. 
And I wanted a building that would remind us that there has always been a dark presence in America that often got overlooked. So I wanted something that wasn't a white marble building. But I also realized that what I needed was a building that would actually work as a museum, right? That it needed to be more than something symbolic. But then, as I began to do a lot of reading about architecture and buildings and coming from Chicago, being immersed in it, I realized that maybe symbolism is one of the most important things you could do. So the building itself is sitting in what we call a corona, a three-tiered corona. Some people see that as being influenced by West African traditions. To me, we came up with that because I came across some pictures of black women in prayer in 1920, and their hands were at this 17 degree angle. And so that began to shape the, the, shape the shape of the building. But the real issue was the building was going to be a bronze corona. And the architects said, well, we can't do solid bronze. So what they wanted to do was to, was to kind of puncture holes in it, just geometric holes. And I said, that's ridiculous. And I realized that I kept thinking about 19th century history. Um, Alan taught me well. And I realized that there were amazing people who did so much work whose stories never get told. And I thought about the enslaved craftspeople who made the um, ironwork that's in Charleston, the screens that are in New Orleans, and that in essence, what we did was we took those designs and put them over the entire building. So that the building itself is a homage to the fact that so much of African American history is hidden in plain sight. And that also helped us create what is going to be the first green museum on the mall. So the notion of really thinking about what the building looked like, what it symbolized, and how it worked as a green building uh, meant a great deal to me, and that was part of the big struggle. Uh, well, let's talk about funding. Uh, talk about the original funding model <laughs> and the magnitude of the fundraising task you were presented with at the outset of the project. When I was hired, I was told that the museum would cost about $185 million and that Congress would give half of that money. And I thought, okay, I think I could do that. But then when I got there and we began to think about what the building really looked like and the challenge of water, because there was the building that you see, 50% of the building is underground. Um, and so we hit water at eight feet and the building is 80 feet down. So um, there were additional costs, shall we say. Um, but ultimately the challenge was that the building was going to cost $550 million, and that even though Congress said they would pay half, the reality is, how did, I make, how did that happen? Congress promised, but part of the job was to then spend every year figuring out the strategy of how to get Congress to give pieces of money. And then it was, realizing that if you had to raise $250, $260 million from the private sector, the model of finding a few good donors wasn't going to work. So what we had to do was really do a couple things. One was I had to figure out how to pressure Congress. Now, let me say this in a nice way so I don't get killed. Um, basically, what I realized is that in order to make sure that Congress would meet its obligation, I needed to make the museum real. So when we had President Obama do groundbreaking in 2012, I had the tractors come in the next day and put a hole next to the Washington Monument because I knew Congress would not let a hole stay next to the Washington Monument. <laughs> so that was part of the strategy. But then the fundraising model was to raise that much money, it meant that we had to find more corporate support than the Smithsonian's ever found before. Traditionally, in a capital campaign in a museum, 17% of your money comes from the corporate community. I had to find 50% from the corporate community. And then, because the Smithsonian really had never done fundraising to this degree, 
when the Indian Museum was built, Congress gave two-thirds of the money, and a lot of the other money came from two Indian casinos. So suddenly, there was not a body of patrons, of people who supported the Smithsonian. So we had to actually begin to identify who were people who would care about this. So it was both find a corporate support, find new donors, but then what really I think helped it was we came up with the notion that this had to be something that was done at the grassroots. So we created a membership program, even though the Smithsonian said that was the wrong thing to do. We created a membership program that people would get a card that they were the founding members of the museum and they could give $25 up to $1,000. Well, that allowed 100,000 people to join as members. That's more members than the Air and Space Museum has, the Museum of American History, more members than even the Indian Museum has. And that allowed us to begin to develop sort of support from the grassroots that both gave us money, but candidly, I took that 100,000 people and I then looked at, I did the work to figure out where e what congressional district was each of them in. So when I went to Congress, I could say there were 70 people or 7,000 people in your district. So it was really part of an overarching strategy. So it really was getting corporate support and part of that was getting the right people on a board. Okay. This was a board that I asked Oprah Winfrey to serve on, but I asked all CEOs. You had to be a CEO to, to make, so I had the CEO of Time Warner, of American Express, of IBM. All of that opened the door to allow us to do the kind of fundraising. And what we've done, we've now raised $545 million, and I still have to raise $25 million, so great. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I'll this I'll is Mike Ryan. But okay. I'm from Jersey. Yeah. I'll split it with you. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Um, now let's turn to the collection. Uh, and uh, the, uh, again, uh, thinking about the vast options that are available, the number of things that could be considered. Did you begin with a detailed plan for the content, or did, the, did, the, did, the, did it evolve over time? Was it a combination of those types of of forces? It was an iterative process. What I did is I made big circles on the wall and said, we're gonna tell the story of the military. We're gonna tell the story of slavery. We're gonna tell certain stories, but we didn't know the directions until we found the stuff. And the building the collections was candidly my biggest worry. Everybody else worried about the money. I worried about, could we find the stuff of history? Because even if you crafted a museum at the Smithsonian that was rife with technology, it would fail because people come to see the Greensboro lunch counter, the Wright Flyer, the Ruby Slippers. So you had to find that stuff. So then my fear was, how do we find it? Where is it? Well, we came up with a notion that ultimately proved correct, but again, we didn't know. The notion was that all of the 20th century, most of the 19th century, and even pieces of the 18th century were still in basements, trunks, and attics in people's homes. So we basically stole the idea of Antique Roadshow and went to places around the country. But what we did is we brought people who knew how to preserve, help you preserve grandma's old shawl, that 19th century photograph. We didn't go to take anything. We actually brought people into Biloxi, Mississippi, or Newark, New Jersey, or Los Angeles, or Chicago, and we said, we'll build the special cases for you. We'll help you figure out how to preserve this material. And then what would happen is people would get so excited that they would say, well, we want to give it to the Smithsonian. Well, the first thing we would do is say, give it to the local museums first. So the local museums felt good. But if it was kind of in the scholarly parlance, really cool, it came back to DC. Um, but that we really began to find amazing things in trunks and attics. I didn't think we could find material on slavery, and I was wrong. We found amazing things. I think that we found almost any story we wanted to tell with the exception of two areas. We couldn't find material on popular culture, film, television, and sports material. Why? Because that's a commodity, right? Mm -hmm. You could sell that. People yeah. didn't want to give that to the Smithsonian. So, we, so that was within the structure, that was the hardest thing we had to do. But the real challenge was that 
that you'd want to have all your collections before you begin to design your building. Well, that just didn't happen. So we had to do a lot of things where we had to be nimble as we move forward. But the reality is, because of this kind of collecting, we found treasures that I wouldn't have ever imagined. Uh, I know that during a process like this, certain, certain items take on a special significance to the people that are acquiring them. Uh, as you reflect on what you've been able to collect to date, are there uh, a number of things that, are, that have special significance to you and should play a very prominent role? Well, I've told this story, but it still means so much to me. Um, I got a call from a collector who said he had Harriet Tubman material. Now, as a 19th century historian, I knew there was no Harriet Tubman material anywhere. There's two spoons in her house in Mount Auburn, New York. So I figured, you know, this is kind of a waste of time. But this collector was a nice guy, and he said, listen, come to Philadelphia, and I'll show you this material. Well, I figured, well, what's the worst that could happen? You get a Philadelphia cheesesteak out of the deal, and you come on home. So I went to this collector's place, and he took me to, into Temple University, and he, oh, and he pulled out a box. And he pulled out photographs of Harriet Tubman no one had ever seen. And then he began to pull out amazing material. He pulled out a shawl. There's a famous picture of Harriet Tubman three days before she died, wrapped in a white shawl. He pulled out that shawl and put it in front of us. And then he pulled out a hymnal. Now, Harriet Tubman couldn't read, but she used to use spirituals as a way to communicate. And so here was a hymnal with all those spirituals she would sing, steal away Jesus, swing low, sweet chariot. And the guy, I looked at him and I said, would you give it to the Smithsonian? I thought he was going to say, you know, here's what it's going to cost. He said, it's yours. Take it with you right now. And so you, it was both the objects, but the generosity. I was also struck by the fact that we found Nat Turner's Bible. When Nat Turner, who led that insurrection in the 1830s, people didn't realize he could read. And I had given a speech at a plantation in South Carolina and somebody came up to me and said, I'm an archaeologist whose specialty is Nat Turner sites. And again, being ignorant, I said, there's no Nat Turner sites. Um, and I kind of blew the guy off for six months. Finally, he kept calling, so I went down to Southampton County, and we walked the sites, and there were great sites of Nat Turner. And I went on the radio that day and said, I wish we had something of Nat Turner. In the county courthouse was a sword that he had when he was captured. But the other thing he had was this Bible. And when the family heard that I was interested, they called and they said, we have kept this Bible. It was given to us at Nat Turner's trial, and we've kept it for all these years, and we want to get it out of our house. I said, you want to get it out? Could you please take it? So the challenge was, was it really the Bible? So we did a lot of the archival research. We found that Bibles like that were sent from the American Missionary Society in 1818 down to that part of Virginia. But then we found fo a photograph of the frontispiece of the Bible from 1870. We were able to digitize that, put it over the Bible, and it matched exactly. So we really felt we found the Bible. But I think the other piece that really sort of moved me was the work that we did recently in terms of finding remnants of the slave ship Sal Jose um, that left Mozambique that sank off the coast of South Africa. What was so powerful about it was that when I decided to go to Mozambique to basically trace the route of the ship, to see the people that originally were enslaved on that ship, there were 450 people from the Makua tribe. When I went there and talked to the chieftain, he suddenly comes up to me and he gives me this beautiful cowrie shell vessel filled with dirt that he and the chiefs did from their region. And he asked me, he said, when you go back to South Africa, would you sprinkle this dirt over the wreck so for the first time since 1794, our people can sleep in their own land? That's the kind of stuff you can't get paid. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. So for me, each of the collections was an amazing story. And so one of the things we're going to do when you come to the museum is not only will you see the story of the artifact and what it meant historically, 
but we'll also tell you how we found it, how we got it, because I think that's been the most powerful part of this, is the willingness of people to share their collections, their stories with the Smithsonian. Uh, I know we want to give ample time for the audience to ask questions, especially our students, but tell us what remains to be done before President oh. Obama dedicates Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the building is completed on the exterior. 80%, 85% of the interior is finished. Now it's, the, it's finishing up the fundraising. There's still another 30, 25 million I gotta find. But it's also the logistics of installing 4,000 artifacts and an equal number of graphics and 145 media pieces. So right now, I spend two hours every day reviewing every media piece is gonna be in the museum. Um, and so really the logistics of that, the other challenge is, which I didn't realize was gonna be such a big challenge, was figuring out how do you open a national museum? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you celebrate this? Who gets tickets to the opening? I got more family I didn't know I had <laughs> uh, who, who swear they're gonna get tickets. Um, and I think, so I spent a lot of time on that, but maybe the most important thing I try to do now is spend a lot of time helping the staff to not be paralyzed by the task in front of them. Mm -hmm. Suddenly to see all the visibility, whether it's 60 minutes or whatever, um, the fact that people go by the building every day and send us notes that they saw it, or we get so many calls of people saying, I've waited forever, I'm gonna be there. Um, and so part of the job is to help the staff realize that no matter what you do, you're gonna be criticized. You're gonna be criticized by the right, you're gonna be criticized by our friends. You talk too much about religion, didn't talk enough about religion. Mm -hmm. But I want them to realize that they have accomplished something that is transformative. As my youngest daughter said, once the building's complete, it means that as long as there's an America, there's a chance to tell this story. I want them to keep that in mind so they can do the work they have to do to get us to the promised land. One final question, I think, before, Peter, we turn it over to Q&A. Um, I'm sure you've thought long and hard about what constitutes success for this important institution. Uh, what are the indicators that would convince you as you look back, let's say 10 years hence, that the museum has accomplished its mission and is a success, and reflect a bit, Lonnie, on what it will take to maintain this national treasure? I think that part of it is gonna be hard to measure. What you want is, as John O'Franklin, the great historian said to me, success is that people will be changed. That people will realize that regardless of race, this is their story too. Um, and that what you really, what I really want is I want people to use the museum not as just a place to look back, but to use the museum to help us wrestle with the contemporary issues we face today. To recognize that to be successful, the museum has to be as much about today and tomorrow as it is about yesterday. And that's difficult because at the Smithsonian, we're a place of commemoration and celebration. We do difficult issues, but on the whole, when people come, they're coming to touch a piece of the true cross. They're not coming to debate issues. So to help this museum help the visitors, both who will come and those that will come online, to realize that this is an opportunity to find that safe space, to have the debates, to wrestle with the issues that have divided us, and hopefully in a small way to, co to close a chasm that has always divided us. And I think the other, me the other measure of success is that everybody will go to the restaurant and buy those $15 hamburgers, so therefore there's extra <laughs> money for the museum to spend. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that, that closes my questions. I will ask the students or anybody in the audience to come to the mics, and we'll uh, answer as many questions as we can in the 30 minutes that remain. Um, my name is Myra Lee, and I'm basically reacting to your last response. And my question is, what is your current strategy to archive present-day issues to make sure that currently 
you have a plan to make sure that what's happening now will not be continuing the process of abbreviated history for African Americans. And at the same time, making sure in the message within your plan of execution that you continue to enlighten westernization that this is true American history as well. Mm -hmm. So to create and build that bridge of connection so that individuals in the African American who identify as so um, don't have this connection, disconnection of American history. Thank you, good questions. I think that first of all, I have the most diverse staff of any museum in America. Because if this is America's story, then a array of Americans ought to shape and interpret it. And so that there are now generations of scholars, at least two different generations of people that will work in the museum that recognize that if it's just seen by one community, we haven't done our job. But I think the other thing that we do is that quarterly, I meet with the curatorial staff and we discuss how do we collect today? What is it? So we were there, for example, to collect Ferguson. We collected the Baltimore um, riots and struggles there. We've collected contemporary issues so that some of which will show up in the museum. Others will be there for curators 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. Because the biggest challenge in a museum is to make sure that you're developing the collections that allow future generations to wrestle with issues. And that's really crucial, and so that's a, just a regular part of what we do. The other part about this is that we've started already doing public programs around difficult issues. We actually have a series of modules online for teachers helping teachers teach race. So that for us, this is the cost of doing business. If we're not of value today, both in traditional ways and in non-traditional ways, the museum has failed. Good, great, thank you. Hi, good evening. Good evening, I saw you when I came in. I know, in the elevator. <laughs> thank you for letting me in, I didn't know where I was going. <laughs> Uh, so first of all, I am so excited to be here tonight, and thank you for providing us with the opportunity to come and to take place in this conversation. So my question, I have many, but I'll only ask one unless no one else comes up. Uh, my question is about the collections. Um, I'm also a history buff, so I was so excited to hear you say that. And you spoke about um, personally acquiring the Greensboro lunch counter, and again, with Nat Turner's Bible. Out of the over 30,000 plus um, artifacts and documents that you all have collected, what is one that you're the most excited about? And could you contextualize that with what you were saying earlier about resiliency, spirituality, and upliftment? And upliftment? Say the last part and what you said, the last part. I was saying, what's your favorite um, museum piece that you guys have acquired? And how would you contextualize that with the theme of spirituality, resiliency, and upliftment? Um, you know, it's so hard to figure out the piece that means the most to me. Candidly, probably, I still think the most important piece I've ever collected was the Greensboro Lunch Counter. Um, because it was both an important story, but it was a story that, candidly, the Museum of American History wasn't that interested in. And that when I collected the Greensboro Lunch Counter, um, I brought it back to, this, to the Museum of American History, and overwhelmingly, the staff said, oh, that's really important, let's put it in storage. And I realized that I was the associate director, so I said, I'm the boss, we're putting it out. <laughs> um, and so that probably means the most to me of anything I've ever collected. But I guess if I were to f pick one piece, there's a piece that we found in a trunk in Georgia, in a small town in Georgia, and it's an amulet. It's a, there was a tribe called the Lobi tribe from West Africa. And they were a tribe that so many of their people were taken and, being, and made enslavement, being enslaved. So in order to protect themselves, they created these spiritual amulets in the shape of slave shackles that you carried with you to keep the slavers away. And the fact that we found one in a trunk in Georgia told me the limits of that amulet, but that story of that peace and trying to imagine a people feeling 
what are the ways we can protect ourselves um, really means a lot to me. Yes. Curious to what degree the elements of the collection are permanent and to what degree you'll transition things through the, through the, through the museum and the degree things transition out, is that a way to connect some of the regional and, and, and other museums around the country that could benefit from what you've collected? I think, Mike, you're absolutely right. I think that the part of what we want to do is recognize that one of the reasons you come to the Smithsonian is for tradition. So you come to see certain things over and over again. Maybe you only go in eighth grade and then, you know, when you're in college and when you bring your family. So that the goal would be that sort of 80% of the museum would be permanent. So that you have those, you know, like as you remember, we put in um, a segregated railroad car and there's a guard tower from Angola prison. Nobody's ever going to move those. So they're going to be there forever. But the notion is to create spaces in the museum so there'll be changing exhibits that will happen over time. But also the way we design the exhibitions, there's a lot of interactive technology, a lot of media. There are ways then you can modernize and change those things that even takes a traditional exhibition and suddenly puts a new spin on it. So we've thought a lot about that. And the other thing we've done is we've created an office of partnership and collaboration. And part of what their job is, is to work with small museums, be they African-American or non-African-Americans, and get them collections that we have that we're not using, that allow them to tell stories in different ways. So that's really key to part of our success. Good. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Idara, and I'm a second year graduate student at SIS. Earlier you stated that one of the challenges that you face is the opening of the museum. And I wonder what volunteer opportunities the museum will have <laughs> available for uh, you know, students and members of the community. I, I think that one of the things that we have is an awful lot of volunteer opportunities. As you can imagine, we're, we're like on the fly. So there are people who have volunteered to help do research on the artifacts. There are people who are actually going to help us um, put in some of the artifacts. There are people who are volunteering to help um, handle the crowds. One of the things we're doing is when we open, I realize there's going to be just amazing crowds. So part of what I decided to do was to actually move part of the Folk Life Festival to be when we open our museum. So we need volunteers to help people with the crowds that are going to go through the tents to hear the music or, or the spoken word. So the easiest thing is you go online to our website and it says volunteers. And then there are people just waiting to take your call. <laughs> Please. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Um, I've been to some pretty thoughtful and also pretty problematic gift shops in some ah. museums that I've uh, been to before uh, when thinking about kind of the commodification of history and of tragedy, um, but also about of identities. Could you talk a little bit about what the gift shop of the <laughs> National African American Museum would be? Well, you know, one of the things that they didn't prepare me in graduate school with was gift shops and restaurants. Um, yeah, that's right. The, the, the challenge for the gift shop is, one, just the changing notion of what are in gift shops, right? When I began this idea, I thought, okay, one of the most important things we got to do is have books, you know? Well, that's not really essential in a book, in a gift shop anymore, right? People get books in different ways. What we've done is really said that the Smithsonian has a whole unit that they just do the shops. And normally what you do is you turn that over to them. What I've said is the Smithsonian gets to control one third of the shop, we get to control two thirds. So that will allow us to shape the kind of product. And one of the things we've done that's different than the Smithsonian's ever done is we've realized there are thousands of small vendors, you know, people who make belts or who've done photograph. So what we've done is actually put in place a process that anybody can contact us and we will see if their materials can come into the Smithsonian gift shop. So part of that is a way to give back. Um, the same thing with the restaurant. Now the restaurant is going to be pretty cool because I will steal from anybody. The Indian Museum has got a great restaurant. So we will have a restaurant that will do five different regional cuisines. 
One will be Low Country, South Carolina. Another is New Orleans. A third is New England seafood. A fourth is barbecue. Um, and a fifth is diaspora. So that will change. That will start with West African, go to Jamaican, and that'll change over time. So we expect the restaurant to be pretty successful. And what I did is about a month ago, I actually had a tasting for my entire staff. Boy, did they eat well. <laughs> so I think you'll love the restaurant. Good. Please. Uh, hello, sir. Um, my name is Kalechi. I'm actually a freshman here at AU. I just want to say it's been a pleasure hearing you speak. You've been awesome. Um, throughout all your years of you know research and studies, I'm sure you've understood why you have such a great passion and a great love for history and of knowledge of not only the African American community, but also many other cultures and communities as well. I just wanted to ask, um, how do you think is the best method to address for the younger audience and next generation and the importance of knowing history that shaped how the world and how culture is today? One more time, the last part of what you said. Of course, I wanted to ask, how do you think is the best method to address to the younger audience the importance of history and why they should know how and what shaped the world as it is today? We spent a lot of time thinking about history and the fact that people usually come to history when they get older, right? And to think about how do you craft the kind of history that works for, that engages, and is also shaped by a younger generation. So part of what we realized is the notion of tying history to contemporary issues is really one of the ways to do it. We've also recognized that um, we, we've done, I've got volumes of research on reaching younger adults, uh, young audiences. But one of the things that was really clear is that for generations who are used to the virtual, that the virtual is the way in, but often the authentic is not part of their experience. So we want to use the virtual as a way into the authentic. And so we think that's one of the ways, and obviously, one of the differences of building a museum today than let's say 15 years ago is thinking about the role of technology. What's the way to allow people to use the technology to shape their own experience? How do we make sure the work we're doing works for the 80 million a year who's gonna come to the museum but won't, will come online? So it's all those kinds of issues that we've wrestled with to try to be more effective. But you'll tell us if we've done a good job. Hi there, um, Hi. Um, my name's Nancy and I'm a recent graduate of the master's program in arts management here. And I wanna get back to fundraising because it seems like everything comes back to money and how to raise it and how to get it. And so I was hoping you might share a couple of your strategies sure. for both the corporate and the individual fundraising aspect, how you decided who to go for and who not to go for and the interaction between the two. Sure, I, I think that there were two things that I learned doing this job. Um, one is that people give to people and that even if you've got a really good story and a good issue, if you're not able to make those connections, if you're not able to have people care about what you do, you're not gonna be able to get to raise money effectively. And one of the few things I can do is to engage people, is to talk to people. And so that really allowed us to sort of get indoors and get people. My notion was if I could get in, I can close. So the key was finding the way in. Finding how do you use volunteers? How do you use your board? How do you use other donors to get you in front of the decision makers. So it really was looking at how we would do that. And what I did is from the corporate community, I decided to look at who were corporations that either need the African American consumer or have strong African American presence on their staff um, or, in, or, in, or in places like Detroit that has a large population. So I went there first and talked about these institutions as places that if they care about America, here's a chance to show. And that really resonated well because 
of the idea of saying this was using a particular culture to understand what it means to us all. That took some of the, candidly, some of the fear away from some of the corporate community. There were a lot in the corporate community who were terrified that we were talking about slavery, et cetera. Uh, there was a one big donor who was going to give a lot of money but said, but only if you don't talk about slavery. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, that wasn't going to work. Um, I can give you that donor. He might come, you know, but he wouldn't, <laughs> he's not coming to me. Um, but I, I also think the other thing was that to realize that we needed to tap a younger cadre of donors. And so we actually came up with a series of programs that fall under the awful name of ambassadors. But basically, what we've done is engage people from 25 to 40 and said, we want to create the next generation of givers. And what we want to do is ask you to give $5,000 over five years. And, that, and then we create a series of programs and events that you shape. And we have now, I think it's probably 80,000 people who are part of that younger group who come to different events. And when I go to different cities, we do an event for the, for the folks that are there. So those are some of the kind of things. Um, I guess the other thing was that what we also did was create a series of media or videos, in essence, that were very short that I could show, especially to foundations, that would have both average people, but also, quite honestly, celebrities talking about how important the museum is. So you roll out Samuel Jackson talking about the museum, or you have Oprah. That helped um, to be able to do that as well. But I want to say it's not been all easy. In fact, I'll give you one example. I won't use the name of the company. But I was, we had worked on a company in Philadelphia for a long time. And they said, OK, Lonnie, come on up you know, on Tuesday. So I take the 6 AM train. I get there. And I go into the corporate offices, and they keep me waiting. Half hour, hour, hour and a half. Then a woman comes out and is saying a name, but it's not my name. It turns out she's saying the name of her boss, but I didn't know that's what it was. So I finally get pulled in. And normally when somebody brings you into an office, they talk to you. The woman didn't say a word to me. So I get into the office, and the guy keeps me waiting for another half hour. He comes in, and he says, you know, I'm only meeting because you had a CEO call my CEO. Um, but I really am not interested in helping you at all. And in fact, he said, let me tell you why not. And he berated me for 40 minutes. And then as we were walking out, the woman that walked me in was sitting at her desk laughing at me. That was the lowest moment of this process. Um, thank God we had already raised some money, so I didn't feel like what a failure I was. So it hasn't been all easy, but that was the worst. Hmm. Hey, please. Good evening, Dr. Good Bunch. Evening. My name is Jamisha Rollerford. I'm actually a faculty member at Howard University. Um, I'm a lecturer in the English department. I'm actually looking to transition out of academia into archival study. Mm -hmm. um, so my question pertains to your personal journey. You mentioned that one of your reservations about this position was that you just didn't think you could do it. As an African-American woman who has dabbled into and is now transitioning out of academia, I know this feeling uh, pretty well, and it's called imposter syndrome. Uh, what would you say to those of us who are moving into spaces where our voices may or may not be well represented and who are reluctant to move into those spaces because we fear that we just may not be good enough? I think that what I've always told people, and again, part of what I learned at AU, is first and foremost, you got to be good. You've got to really you know, ply, try your trade learn yourself, be the best you can be. And then it really is a notion in my mind of taping the, taking a leap, right? Of basically saying, I will take the risk because the reward is worth it. And for me, it's always like, the dumbest thing I ever did in my life was actually jump out of an airplane at 18 years old, right? <laughs> dumbest thing in the world. Has to do with being in love, but that's another conversation. <laughs> but I realized if I survived that, I could do other things. So I, you have to find the thing that gives you the confidence that you can make that leap. And then the key is, have a, I have a small chip on my shoulder. Um, 
for anybody that said I couldn't do it or I wasn't good enough, and I just rub that every now and then to make sure I can go ahead and do what I've got to do. So find your own little chip. I Good know evening, you. Dr. Brunch. Hello, how are you? Um, the museum is already looks very welcoming. The building itself, one feels drawn in to listen to many, many stories. My, um, I guess, question, concern is, what are you and the museum doing to attract let me say for the African-American communities, it'll be like a temple. But how would it attract those who don't know the stories? For the international visitor, mm -hmm. on the mall in the summer, there are many families, individuals that come maybe for a day or two. It's like a smorgasbord, you know, where should we go? What should we do? Competing with so many other museums. So what is the plan for that? And just one other thing, you mentioned um, you wanted to be a professor. So where does the professor bunch, the director bunch come in together to what, what kind of um, teaching, let's say, what kind of learning educational element is um, going to draw people into the museum? Well, the answer to the last part, I mean, I think that as you know, the Smithsonian is really a place driven by scholarship. And so for me, the museum becomes my classroom. Uh, the museum becomes the place where we think about, first of all, how do we serve as K through 12? How do we really craft programs that contribute mightily? Because so much of what is defined as museum education doesn't improve the educational system. So I've said to staff, I want things that really we can point towards that make education better. I think the first part of your question is really about the notion of crafting a place that lets other people find their stories. So for example, one of the things we look to do is we explore the impact of the Civil Rights Act of 64, how that changed immigration policy. Suddenly there are people who story is really tied to that, they don't realize that. Um, but also what we realize is so many people, as I said, from overseas, their first contact in Amer with America is African American culture. So we've already reached out and created partnerships globally, doing things with the different embassies, um, both here and then abroad, making sure that we're part of the agenda of visitation when you come to the United States. So really thinking strategically about how we do that. Great, please. Hello, Dr. Bunch, I'm glad to be here. I'm Cheryl Franklin. And I don't know how easy this question is for you to answer. How, did you say easy? Easy. I'd like easy well, every now and okay, then. Okay, I mean, I don't know. Because it might be big, it might be little. It's okay. An elephant in the room. How do you address the challenges of history that as time goes on, and as the people who were there or knew the people that were there have moved on and stories become, I would say, romanticized, if mm. you will. I'll give like a, a recent example and then one that is one of my soapboxes. Well, I'll give the first one. One is about how our ancestors were raped on the plantation. Now, I lived in the South for many years. I'm from the Northeast. I lived in the South for many years. Knew people that knew slaves. Well, my mother knew them. You know, she was born in 1930. And they will say adamantly, they were not raped. They don't, they didn't say more, but they had heard the story. That's one story. Another one more recently was of the movement uh, in the South. And I often heard people that grew up in the South talking about those integrationists. Mm -hmm. And these are African-American people mm -hmm. who felt that, for instance, school teachers lost their jobs because of mm -hmm. um, integration or um, businesses mm -hmm. uh, 
went out of business because of inter uh, African-American-owned businesses. So by that I mean, it's not a defense, but how do you tell the story where it's realistic, where mm -hmm. it's told, not in a romantic point of view, the story that people want to hear, mm -hmm. but, but, and not an ugly story, but a real story. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some ways, that's why I said you have to think about how do you tell the people not just what they want, but what they need, right? And I think that the key for us is both scholarship and then finding the kind of oral histories that allow people to speak for themselves. I think that there will be people who will come in and find stories that go counter to some of the romantic notions. You know, I mean, one of the things as an urban historian, every city talks about how wonderful the black downtown was before integration. Well, that's, that's a tad overstated. Um, and so we want to tell those stories. I, I, I guess for me, it's again, hearing John Hope Franklin in my ear, who would always say, Lonnie, the unvarnished truth, mm -hmm. the unvarnished truth. And that truth comes from a tension between scholarship and memory. But we always err on the side of scholarship. Did I do okay, Alan? Yes. Okay, just check. Yep. <laughs> do you get a mic here? Oh, I'm sorry. I think you're next, yeah. In fact, I consciously argued against that. I argued that, well, first of all, because I know the Smithsonian, even if I went to every museum and took everything, it would only give me 20% of what I needed. So I had to fig find it anyway. But also, I would argue that things should remain where they are. Now, the key ought to be something revolutionary, which is Smithsonian museums talk to each other. But that's, you know. <laughs> but I think the reality is, what I would argue is that by crafting this museum, the Indian Museum, American history, American art, what you have is different portals into what it means to be an American. And that I would want people to enter that through the portal that they are most comfortable with, but that we then encourage them to walk through other doors. So I want the fact that the Smithsonian American Art Museum has some of the most amazing African American art I've ever seen, and it should be there. But it should also then point them to us or other places. So I think that if the Smithsonian can really communicate effectively and really help people understand that you're getting a big story, but you're getting it through a particular lens. That would be a major change for the institution, and I think would help America become a better use of, a better consumer of museums. Hi, uh, I'm Isaiah Wooden. I teach in the Department of Performing Arts here, and I just was curious to hear you say more about the strategy for organizing the exhibitions. Uh, and is there a particular emotional journey you want viewers to, viewers to go on? Um, part of what we did was we really looked at what are the stories that people are going to be moved by? What are other stories we need to tell? What are stories that are going to surprise people? So part of the strategy was that I had a series of questions that I made every curator answer. What are the emotional moments in the particular exhibition you're doing? What are the controversial? What are the difficult moments? And so that I want everybody to know that they should be through every exhibition, whether it's one on sport or one on slavery. Then what I said is, let's look at how we build the museum so that um, there are a series of history galleries that are below ground that take you from Africa into the 21st century, that provide the narrative that people don't have, and that a lot of those difficult moments are there. But then there are thematic exhibitions above, exhibitions on culture, exhibitions on community, that would allow people not to escape the difficult moments, but that we've given them the narrative, now they can understand the two-sided coin that is rhythm and blues in the 1950s. What does that tell us both about the music? What does it tell us about a changing America? So it was both the strategies within each exhibition, it was then the placement of exhibitions within the, within the building. For example, one of the things that people said to me is, well, 
you know, you shouldn't do exhibitions on music and sport. That's what people expect. But it seems to me, on the other hand, you don't want to outsmart yourself, right? And if you can take those stories and put a different spin on them, um, I think they become very powerful. But I realize that there are people who are going to want to come in and say, I want to go hear music. So music's at the very top. You got to go through a lot to get there. <laughs> uh, so it really was thinking strategically about on your way to music, you might stop and see an exhibition that talks about how change is made in America called Make a Way Out of No Way. Mm. So it really was both the strategy within the exhibition and the strategy within the entire building. <coughs> I'm making this up as I go along. I don't know. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Bunch. Thank you so much. My name is Asantua. I'm an emerging curator in African American history and Wonderful. culture. And I wanted to say thank you because the museum for people who are coming through school now and are coming from smaller African American museums has really added another layer of experience and professionals who can help guide us in our future. And for those of us who are coming, like you said, the field. 50 years ago wasn't what it is today, and so much has happened. So I want to thank you and your team for people like me. Thanks. So, sorry. Um, so my question is, considering that, can you talk about the role? Obviously, museums are public history institu institutions, and the mission is to educate people from all um, levels and interests. Um, um, but how do you see the museum contributing to the legacy of African American history and culture scholarship? And what resources do you envision, you and your staff envision, to, um, that may be accessible to emerging scholars in African American history and culture? Well, I think that part of the challenge is how do we serve both new scholars, new curators? So part of it is the traditional way the Smithsonian does it. We've got a very rigorous fellowship program for pre-docs, for post-docs, to get those folks in. I'm talking to people at AU about possibly those kind of connections that would sort of be a pipeline. But I also think that part of it really is, is to demonstrate how important these stories are and how that institutions, be they the California State Museum or the Chicago Historic Society can really expand what they do because seeing the quality of the work and the quality of the people. So that part of the goal is to, yes, bring people to Washington, but ultimately push them back into other communities so that they can do the work there. When you ask me what's the goal of the museum, on the one hand, it's simple. It's to be the first green museum. It's to craft exhibitions that are ripe with scholarship and emotion. It's to be a place where education matters. But when you boil it down, what I think the goal of the museum is pretty simple. It's to make America better. Mm. And I think that's what the Smithsonian can do. So we've set the bar high, but the goal ought to be, how is this place part of the struggle to help America live up to its stated ideals? How is this part of the struggle to, as Langston Hughes said, let America be America. Bonnie, you began with a story of coming to the American University campus and finding a professor, Dorothy Gondos, who spent three hours with you. Uh, Lonnie Bunch has just effectively spent three hours with us. And I have to say, I know that everybody here is incredibly grateful. The really great news is that we have a reception out there and Director Bunch has agreed to stay and talk to you individually at the reception. So on behalf of President Kerwin, the entire American University community, thank you very much, Ronnie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You did a good job.